Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a great lunch. So it's my uh, it's an honor to introduce the next speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Horvath. Dr. Horvath is a biogerontologist whose research lies at the intersection of several fields, including epigenetic biomarkers of aging, preclinical and clinical studies, genomics, epidemiology, and comparative biology. Dr. Horvath is the principal, principal investigator at Altos Labs. He and his UCLA colleagues published the first epigenetic clock for saliva in 2011. In 2013, he published the first pan tissue clock, also known as the Horvath clock. Recently, he presented a universal clock that applies to all mammals. And he's a recipient of several awards, and he has been on Clarivate's annual list of the world's most influential scientific researchers every year since 2018. So let's please welcome Dr. Horvath. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I will talk today about uh, maximum lifespan. And the thinking is that um, it's really a readout that will perhaps be interesting to the biotech industry in maybe 50 years, right? Where will the Buck Institute be in 50 years? It's probably all about maximum lifespan of a species. But it was all motivated by this question, what is longevity? You know, we all go to these longevity conferences and um, what's the definition? What do we mean by it? And here's um, a list of um, other explanations, lifespan, life expectancy. Um, but I, allow me to give a mathematical definition because, so what I call maximum longevity is really the maximum value of the age at death of billions of let's say humans. You have a species like humans and you really um, keep track of when people die and then you say there was is a French lady, Jeanne Calmont, and she reached the age of 122. The maximum ever observed. Um, but of course, what most people really think of when they talk about longevity is all about their own lifespan. So they will say, I'm currently 50 years old. How old um, 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 will I become? Hopefully, I will reach age 90. So you care about how many more years you have lef uh, left to live. That's time to death. And it's very important to um, look at these definitions because in our mind, we confuse them. We just call it longevity. But it's really um, quite different. So yesterday um, um, there was a symposium on biomarkers of aging and it was really all about what I would say time to death, time to frailty, time to various diseases, you know, of the individual. So when people talk about biologic age, they really mean my biologic age. And um, this is my only slide about that aspect, time to death, because my talk is about um, maximum lifespan, you know. So this has been called the central question of biology. Why do similar species, such as mammals, have markedly different maximum lifespan? Um, as I said, humans, 122, the maximum lifespan of a mouse is less than five years. And there are famous examples like the naked mole rat that lives a long life, or bats. And it's the central question that actually goes back to Aristotle 2,000 years ago. But we actually have a fairly good understanding why some species evolve along uh, maximum lifespan, and it's all about avoiding predators. If you can, birds live remarkably long lives. Why? They can fly away, you know. Uh, or big animals have fewer predators. Again, they can in evolve a um, um, longer maximum lifespan. And, um, but um, there are certain strategic questions for the, our longevity field, and 
I'm not claiming I have the answer, but every um, director of a research program has to answer them. So first of all, the first question is, are short-lived species such as mice and rats truly effective models for studying longevity in a long-lived species, humans? We are a remarkably long-lived species. When you look at other primates, gorillas, the maximum life of a gorilla was 60 years, you know, so we are remarkably long-lived. And um, arguably, it's actually quite easy to make a mouse or a rat live longer, you know, so we have caloric restriction or um, various um, 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 uh, parabiosis ideas um, or um, growth hormone receptor knockout, so we, we can fairly easily extend the lifespan of a mouse. And, um, but maybe it's the wrong model, you know. And conversely then, well, maybe, um, this comes to the second question, well, maybe we can discover the secrets of um, longevity from exceptionally long-lived species, Bats. Some bat species can live for 40 years, although they have the size of a mouse. Or whales. Um, the bowhead whale can live 211 years. And, well, if so, why don't we study these long-lived animals? Um, and, um, of course, leaders in the field of longevity research have done that, you know. So um, here are a couple of papers where um, Vadim Gladyshev, Vera Gorbonova, for, um, they look, for example, at gene expression levels in, in, and compare long-lived to short-lived species, and then they have various insights into that. There's a huge literature on that, um, learning the secrets of longevity from different species. And um, now, before I go on, I wanted to ask the, you a couple of questions. So, um, what is the maximum lifespan of a 10-year-old? And what is the maximum lifespan of a healthy 50-year-old? And what is the maximum lifespan of a 50-year-old who, who is obese, a smoker, does everything um, incorrectly? And the punchline is, it's of course 122, you know, the maximum lifespan is a species characteristic, you know. And, um, and famously, um, as a, the first speaker mentioned, the oldest human ever, Jean Calment, smoked, you know. So, um, so um, and, um, while you are awake, I wanted to already give you the punchline, um, the, the key insight from, from a seven-year project on studying maximum lifespan. Here it is. So, biological processes that relate to time to death of an individual, what you care about, um, these processes often differ from those that relate to the maximum lifespan of the species. Okay, so for example, smoking, it clearly impacts the lifespan of many people, but it won't affect the maximum lifespan of the species, do you see? Or, or conversely, if you, if you really eat your vegetables all day long, um, yeah, you will probably live a few more years, but, but it won't affect the maximum lifespan, you know. And um, so that's a key insight, but I will now flesh it out. And um, to do that, we used um, 15,000 tissue samples from 348 mammalian species. And um, we collected um, these different um, species in a large consortium, almost 200 collaborators, people who had spent decades collecting various animal tissues, putting them in the freezer. And so we collected everything except this one animal. And um, this is what I like about applied science. It's so easy to become famous, you know. So what you do after this talk, you get a ticket, you fly to Australia, 
And then you look for this roadkill, which is a marsupial mole, okay? <laughs> you profile it. This is a, um, for people who collect stamps. The, the rarest stamp, the blue Mauritius stamp, is uh, worth uh, $4 million. That is the $4 million roadkill, you know? It's actually... Um, Anyways, um, so we, but um, what I do want to say is we, we covered 25 out of 26 taxonomic orders, primates, bats, carnivores, rodents, everything except, um, anyways, large data set. And importantly, we also made this uh, data um, publicly available. You can download the data. Um, we have software scripts, we have annotations. Um, please use it in your models. So why would that data set be interesting to you? Well, you could say, well, maybe I will learn the secrets of maximum lifespan from this data. You know? So I invite you to um, mine these data. Um, a, a quick technical thing. Um, different species have different DNA sequences. And um, what we did in this consortium is to look at ultra-conserved stretches of DNA. DNA that is present in species that are separated by hundreds of millions of years of evolution. So we, we use a certain technology called the mammalian methylation array. And um, now let's come to an epigenetic predictor of maximum mammalian lifespan. Here it is. So um, these are now 348 species, and everything is on the log scale. We log transform maximum lifespan. And the y-axis shows the predicted maximum lifespan based on cytosine methylation. You know. And I think on the log scale, you see a correlation 0 0.89. That's an unbiased. It's a cross-validation estimate. And so this is kind of neat, you know, so um, you go to the jungle, you find a piece of uh, tissue, a tail or whatever you find, an ear, you don't know what it is, you know, and you give it to me. I also don't know what it is, but I, <laughs> I can tell you the maximum lifespan is X. And uh, similarly, we can estimate the gestation time more accurately. I can tell you gestation time is two months. I can tell you the age of sexual maturity of that species. So a lot of these species characteristics can be estimated very accurately. And um, one way to pre um, conceptualize this predictor is, well, it's a biomarker, right? You, um, uh, and now, uh, l let's just think, um, 50 years down the road, the Buck Institute has a meeting on how to extend lifespan. Um, they would, we could now measure whether your intervention affected the maximum lifespan, you know. Um, so it's a biomarker. But um, if I'm honest, um, I... I don't see any use for it, okay? <laughs> it's, um, I, what, I, uh, what I'm pleased about is that Vera Gorbunova, who is a luminary in comparative biology and aging, she loves this biomarker. So I, there's a, um, we disagree on the utility of this biomarker. But um, I start out by saying um, one thing that it lends itself to do is to show the female advantage of maximum lifespan in 18 different species, you know. So everyone knows in humans, women obviously um, live longer, and we confirm it, you know, with this biomarker. And so we do in 18 other species, but interestingly, not in hundreds of species, you know. It's just, um, yes. For example, in mice, a female mouse does not live longer than a male mouse. You know, it's, it's not in all species. And um, so one thing what makes me nervous about this biomarker is, or, or why I don't like it, is because it doesn't really relate to chronologic age, right? Coming back to what I said, time to death. If you are 50-year-old, you, you're 
time to death, let it be 40 years, right? And um, so there's a connection um, with chronologic age. But um, this predicted maximum lifespan has an ambiguous relation. So in some species, it's positively correlated with age and others with negatively. But overall, I wouldn't expect it to correlate with cr uh, chronologic age, why it's a species characteristic. And also, what one can do is one can use this biomarker in a Cox regression model to actually predict time to death. For example, in the Framing M Heart study, and sure enough, it does. It's a, it doesn't predict your individual time to death. Do you see? You give me your blood sample. I estimate the maximum lifespan of the species based on your blood. It doesn't sit, tell me anything about how long you will live. And similarly, it doesn't relate to body mass index, smoking pack years, and um, other measures that are typically associated with human, human mortality risk. And that's why I don't think it's useful, you know. And um, on a brief technical note, I want to say, so we're using a particular array technology that looks at these ultra-conserved cytosines, but we really need to measure this, bio, uh, this platform in human epidemiologic cohorts in order to translate insights from comparative biology to humans. So there's a technical challenge. Um, I now come to a different uh, topic. Um, this is known as epigenome-wide association study. So the, um, um, in this array, we have 36,000 uh, cytosines, um, and we can correlate each cytosine to maximum lifespan. And that's done here. So here, every dot is a different species, and you see six different panels. And the point I want to make is that um, we do have some cytosines that individually correlate quite strongly with maximum lifespan. And then you can ask, well, what is known about these cytosines? Are they next to interesting genes? And so this is done here. Um, so we look at um, genes that um, relate to maximum lifespan. And when you look at those, um, the experts will recognize Hox genes and developmental genes. So the genes that relate to maximum lifespan of, our, of the species um, relate to developmental genes that play a role in um, organ morphogenesis, patterning, um, and so on, but not things that you would typically uh, associate with human mortality risk. And um, you can do a bioinformatic analysis and ask, well, what are the upstream regulator of, of maximum lifespan? And there was a surprise. Um, we find some of these, uh, yam, it's known as Yamanaka factors, OCT4, for example, SOX2. So these are the factors uh, that are often um, or currently being used for this um, strategy of epigenetic reprogramming for rejuvenation. So it's interesting that these Yamanaka factors that are associated with um, um, epigenetic reprogramming, they also pop up when we look at maximum lifespan. Um, here, um, I wanted to show you what is uh, what a, um, the genome looks like of a long-lived species. Um, let me start out with the blue curve. The blue curve is mean methylation across the uh, DNA. Um, the zero point is the transcriptional start site. And, what, um, and um, so we see valleys and hills, you know. And um, the red curve shows you association with maximum lifespan. And you see the curves track each other. And what that means is the following, that long-lived species have methylation patterns that um, are characterized by steep hills and deep troughs, hilly. By contrast, short-lived species like a mouse, the methylation landscape is rather flat and uniform. You know. Yeah. Now I want to talk about 
chronologic age effect. Forget maximum lifespan. We can do EWAS of chronologic age. And again, we find certain genes, but these genes are now totally different. So these are genes um, that um, are bound by a certain repressive complex known as polycom repressive complex 2. And um, here I show you um, the overlap between cytosines that relate to chronologic age versus cytosines that relate to maximum lifespan overlap. And basically the overlap is minimal, you know. So this is a little bit perhaps surprising, but cytosines that relate to maximum lifespan is Hox genes, developmental genes, they are different from those that change as we age. And um, when we try to under, uh, understand methylation changes, we always use something called chromatin state analysis. We, um, and um, so the um, DNA can be separated into chromatin states, um, promoter regions, enhancer regions, heterochromatin, um, and so on, bivalent chromatin. And they're characterized by high methylation and low methylation. And uh, uh, Often these regions are actually highly conserved between mouse and human. And so when we look at epigenetic age effects, there's one chromatin state that really pops up. It's called bivalent promoter regions. These are parts of the DNA that are critical in development. And so um, just to um, finish this part of the dis um, talk, so we do see, find these distinct CPG patterns. CPGs that relate to age are different from the, that, those that relate to um, uh, maximum lifespan. But I was actually disappointed with the result, you know, because um, um, I wanted to find a connection between aging and maximum lifespan. And there is a way to do it. And this comes to a completely different analysis method. And this is about looking at methylation dynamics, rate of change. And I, I will um, um, now talk about that idea. It's an old idea. So um, as you perhaps remember from um, your high school, you can measure the velocity, right? The rate of change. And here on the, x, uh, on the y axis, you may have methylation, and on the x axis, age, of course. And the question is then whether the average rate of change in methylation relates to maximum lifespan. And um, the answer is absolutely, but it depends um, on the chromatin region, you know. So um, here I. Sh um, remember, I talked about the so-called chromatin states. There are um, over 100 uh, such states, but here I show you 54 chromatin states. And only in certain, these bivalent promoter regions, do we observe that the rate of change of methylation relates to um, uh, lifespan. And here's the... Um, the inside, every, um, each dot is a different species. Uh, we're, we're looking here at 125 different mammalian species. And on the x-axis, in the left panel, I have log-transformed lifespan. And on the y-axis, I have this rate of change of methylation. And we see this very strong inverse relationship. You know? And... Um, but when you carefully look at the dynamic changes of methylation across the lifespan, it's non-linear, you know. So um, here I show you um, results for blood samples from pigs. And wh um, when these pigs are very young, you see a real, really quick increase of methylation. And then after the pigs uh, reach um, sexual maturity, you see basically that it levels off, you know. And so um, what we find is that the rate of change of methylation in young animals correlates with the rate of change in old animals, but um, in general, rate of change in young is much faster than in old. And um, 
Yeah, I will skip the math. Um, do you do you need this after lunch? Or? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm easy on you. <laughs> um, I'm skipping a lot of the math because I like you. <laughs> So um, the, uh, we, we have certain fundamental equations about uh, maximum lifespan. So equation one I explained, rate of change of methylation is one divided by maximum lifespan. The second it, um, I didn't touch upon is that the correlation between methylation and age actually does not uh, relate to maximum lifespan. And then that uh, the third law is that in young animals the rate of change um, correlates with the rate of change in old animals. And um, I've started a non-profit foundation, the Epigenetic Clock Foundation, um, that offers methylation testing. So if you have any animal models, uh, mouse, rat, dog, cat, pig, whatever you have, we can measure epigenetic age. Um, and I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. There's someone in the uh, fro second row. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's no, mic. no mic. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, several answers. Um, for certain clocks, there isn't. So we have multiple epigenetic clocks, and um, there are certain clocks where you don't see any relationship with telomere length. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I need to tell you that. Um, um, so telomere length really measures an, a different aspect of aging. You know, it reflects proliferation. You know, and um, methylation clocks d do not uh, reflect uh, proliferation. For example, epigenetic clocks also apply to uh, neurons, non-dividing cells. They apply to um, cardiomyocytes, heart tissue. You know, and again, non-dividing. You know, so methylation clocks um, do not. Uh, correlate with proliferation. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the role of cortisol in that methylation and whether or not uh, changing uh, endogenous cortisol rhythms might alter that methylation? Yes, the question is what's the role of cortisol? You know, there are definitely publications on that topic that establish a connection, you know. So um, I'm, I haven't worked in that, but there is a connection, you know. Um, uh, let me be vague. <laughs> but um, a Google search will dig out as, as citations, yeah. yeah. Max, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, um, so the question is, why don't we think about maximum lifespan right now? And um, allow me to um, report a conversation I had with my wife over dinner. I said, um, Laura, I have good news. I have found a way that if we, the next child can live like 40% longer, you know. There's only one little drawback. It will be a dwarf, you know, a dwarf child. <laughs> and... Um, she wasn't enthusiastic about it, and, and, and it was uh, it didn't go anywhere, you know. But um, um, but more seriously, um, and why did I say it? It's a famous result that these dwarf mice, growth hormone receptor knockout mice, you know, or mice where the pituitary gland is impaired, they live 40 percent longer. You know, it's it's what I call a gold standard intervention on epigenetic clocks. It, that really uh, an Ames dwarf mouse, no, sorry, not, uh, uh, sorry, miss, a snell, uh, for example, a snell dwarf mouse has a substantially younger epigenetic age in um, all organs, you know, so 
and that by yeah but um, to give you a more serious answer it's basically i think in order to extend the maximum lifespan of the species you really need to interfere with conception right you, uh, you change the species good luck getting that approved you know that's like <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah please uh, yeah. Grimage, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that still holding up in your subsequent analyses? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, just to um, uh, explain that, you can measure vegetable intake in people with a blood test. It's called carotid, you measure their car carotenoids. And it turns out that these carotenoid levels have a pretty strong negative correlation with our best mortality risk predictor called grim age, but really most clocks that predict lifespan. And um, yeah, I really believe it. This, the effect is strong. Um, I eat uh, frozen vegetables whenever I'm at home, you know, so <laughs> I eat lots of vegetables. So I, I think it's a, a strong finding. Mm -hmm. In the back, yeah. Here. please. Yeah. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you've used um, several tissues to uh, measure the methylome in all the species that you compared? Yes. So is there one tissue that somehow performed better at, at predicting maximum lifespan? Yeah, that's a good question. There was a bit of a tissue effect, you know, so it turned out when we applied the predictor to blood, in many species the estimate was higher than in, in, in non-blood tissues, you know. So that was a finding. Um, I don't quite know what to make of it, you know, so, mm, I mean, um, this is kind of a question of the future, really. Are there certain tissues where a maximum lifespan predictor um, leads to a much larger estimate? And for a while we saw that in the cerebellum, I remember that's a cere uh, part of the brain, we saw much larger lifespan estimates, you know, than, for example, in blood, you know. But um, I'm not confident to make very strong statements because our data set wasn't perfectly balanced, you know, it, 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 um, a difficult, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can yes. Mm -hmm. um, within your lifespan predictor, does that work within the same species? So if you use, for example, the dwarf mice compared to wild type mice, are you able to predict that there is a lifespan difference? Yes. Uh, interestingly, um, when we applied this maximum lifespan predictor to dwarf mice versus uh, controls, we did see a difference in the expected direction for certain organs, but not all organs, you know. Yeah. And how mm -hmm. early can you detect that within the lifespan of the mouse? Oh, you would detect it pretty much right away. You, so you, you detect it at birth already, I would say. It seems like yeah. pretty good utility then for the predictor. You can make okay. a new mouse and predict whether it's going to live I'm glad you're positive about it. <laughs> 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 I don't like it, but I mean, let's, let's hope you guys... Uh, it, all the software code is published in supplements of bioarchive papers. So. Uh, please, yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought the chart was really interesting. Uh, did, is there any pattern that you've noticed or identified in species that are outliers uh, on the, the chart with the association between uh, methylation <coughs> and maximum lifespan? I know humans might be because of like healthcare and maybe some other stuff, but other species. Yeah, just to echo what you just said, the, the number one species that gave me a lot of headaches, it was really humans, you know, because um, uh, when we applied the biomarker to humans, it consistently underestimated the maximum lifespan. Think like it would estimate age 70 or 80, you know, so, and by now, by now, it depends on the tissue type, but a substantial underestimate, you know, and so, with the other species that are famous, like the naked mole rat, or it, it, it just fit the pattern, you know. So some people believe the naked mole rat has negligible senescence, which would imply it can live forever, but all of our methylation studies indicate that this is not at all the case, you know. So we have uh, methylation clocks for naked mole rats, and um, to me, the naked mole rat is 
kind of as interesting as a human. We are, we are long-lived, the naked mole rat is long-lived, but we are not immortal and the naked mole rat is not immortal, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, wonderful talk. Uh, yes. That links to my question. At the beginning of your talk, you launched the idea that obviously we might not be looking at the right animal model, and I was just curious, how is this informing your current research at Altos and for the world? Because we, we do have loads of mice in our yeah. current... I mean, there's no way around mice. Everybody uses them, we use them, you know, but um, yeah, I am... I mean, it's, fa uh, the, it's a cliche to say that many drugs work well in a mouse but don't translate, you know, so I... Um, I mean, I, I would love to have bigger animal models. I really like this idea of using um, dogs, right, as a companion um, animal. I think that's a great idea, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess okay. I'll ask a yeah. question quick. So, yes. uh, and maybe, and again, I'm not I'm big on epigenetics, but do plants also have an epigenome? Do they suffer from aging? Yeah, um, they do. Um, I'm not working on it, but I remember um, there are some people who uh, generate methylation data from plants. And so I was wondering, uh, based off of that, why not look to, to their models of, I guess, um, methylation as a... Because trees live a long-ass time, so... Yeah, I... Uh, no, I'm with you, you know. So um, methylation in plants... Um, plays a role in stress response, you know, they sense uh, there's a drought or cold, you know, so it, uh, it, um, it helps with that aspect, you know. Um, there's something to be done there. Um, I won't do it, but um, yeah, I think it's worthwhile to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. The last question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I paid, uh, my, my, my friend actually did pay two of them about $500. And, and, and I told them not to give them the correct age, just see if they can find that. Both, two different companies, both um, 10 years off. And, um, and one unrelated question, there is an immoral animal is the, um, the, the, um, it's, it's, a, it's a sea animal. No, the um, the <laughs> jellyfish. Jellyfish. Uh, I see. Um, uh, so, so two separate questions. Did you look at the jellyfish? Why no, are they important? No, you okay. know this. This was the mammalian methylation right, consortium. Right. It it burned. Uh, right. No, but <laughs> yeah, no. I it, mean, it burned seven years of my life. Right. I don't have seven years left. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, f basically, future researchers should really uh, go to vertebrates, you know. So all vertebrates have cytosine methylation. Think birds, amphibians, right. fish, you know. So there's a lot. Uh, it would be exciting, you know. So it's, um, um. Now, regarding your question about the Horvath clock estimate, you know, from different companies, you know, companies have really different implementations. You know, as you know, there are so many clocks, and they measure different aspects. Some clocks relate to telomere length, others don't. Some relate to inflammations, others don't. You know, so there are all these subtleties. Um, there are 28 million cytosines in the DNA, so you can really build different clocks. And, um, and the, you get different results. It's very frustrating. Um, it would be nice to standardize things. And so um, yesterday there was a meeting from the Biomarker Consortium where there's now an effort underway to um, build benchmark data sets, then we compare different clocks. So my great hope is, you know, that the field will arrive at standards, you know. But in the meantime, um, please don't, do not waste your money on methylation clocks, you know. <laughs> it's, um, there's nothing actionable, right? You measure it, okay, I'm older, I'm young. What do you do about it, you know? Very little. Like, if um, you don't need a methylation clock to know you should eat vegetables, and, and also uh, you don't need to spend several hundred dollars on that. Yeah. But anyway, thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs>